Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Colin? I, I thought I heard some wonderful music in the background as well. You did. That was to remind me that I have a podcast at two o'clock. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I love the the background. Is that one of your libraries in the back? Yes, one of the many libraries we have in, <laughs> in my my Zoom background folder. <laughs> Oh man, that's a, that's amazing. Well, happy Friday. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. How's everything going in? Are you in Toronto right now? I'm in Toronto. Nice. Yes. Yeah. I, I think we're in a third lockdown now. It's hard to keep up. Oh no. <laughs> oh man. My, Where are uh, you? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Ah. So yeah, I don't think we ever even had a full lockdown. So wow. it's just been nice. wild west over here, but I, um, I ended, unfortunately my wife and I, we just came down with COVID. We were, oh, yeah, yeah. We, um, that's the little raspiness in my voice. Um, it's sexy. Don't worry. It's yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually glad it happened because before my voice is very whiny. And so, um, it's good to have it, but we ended up, we were quarantining. We were doing so well, haven't seen family that's, and, and trying to just stay safe. And then we're like, I think we can reward ourselves with one dinner. And then I guess mm -hmm. that's how it worked out. So that's what happens with rewards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's like mom, it reminds me of the cookie jar that mom had and was like, no cookies. You finally get one and then the cookie has COVID. So, yes. Um, so, uh, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for joining a comedy advice podcast with your host, Stefan Satani and special guest. If you guys are wondering who that voice is and if you're just closing your eyes while watching the YouTube video, it's international comedy icon, Colin Mockery. Welcome to the, to the podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And we, what we're going to do is we'll talk a little bit about you. And then um, there are some questions that fans have sent in from Reddit and Yahoo Answers, some really silly ones. So we'll, we'll give some advice to those those question sure. askers. Yeah, this is the person but, to come to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but first, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. I mean, I know COVID's been rough for everyone. You were just talking about in Toronto, third lockdown. Um, and I wanted to ask a little bit about pre-COVID, the PC days. Um, I, I know you were doing hip hop and um, on tour with Brad Sherwood. I just, what was it like pre-COVID? And then what have you been kind of doing in the meantime to, to scratch your comedy itches? Yeah, in the old days, it was quite nice. Uh, as you said, <laughs> I, I, was touring, uh, I was touring with Brad I was mm -hmm. touring uh, Hiprov with Asad Meki, the hypnotist, and I was also shooting a movie in Utah all at the same time. And then the next day I was in the vulnerable group of a pandemic. <laughs> it just turned like that. Um, so it was, um, I mean, it was nice leading up to then. I, you know, I was busy uh, doing mm -hmm. various projects, so uh, it kept me interested. And then I thought, oh, well, I, I guess this will put a little wrench in the works for a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I, I remember that that first month being like, oh, this will be this will blow over in a month. Yeah. yeah. I, and I thought it was so interesting with um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about hip hop with Assad Meki, where uh, I saw a couple clips, which it fascinated me. He's a master hypnotist. You're a master improviser. And so um, you guys got together and Assad would bring on audience members, hypnotize them, and you would do improv with them. Yeah. Yeah. We decided to take two art forms that people really don't believe in and <laughs> put them together. So we saved in one spot. You can come and have all your disbelief in one particular area. It's uh, yeah, it's, um, it was one of those shows that I said, sure, because it sounded um, dangerous and outside my comfort zone. So I thought, yeah, that's, I, that's what I like to do, because I find that's where I had the most fun. And that's usually where the most mm -hmm. magic happens. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then it wasn't it was the first our first show was at the Edinburgh Festival. We had done some sort of warm ups and just before uh the show and i realized i should have asked this earlier <laughs> but i said hey if i ask them to do this will they do it and asad said i don't know uh <laughs> it, it depends on the subject some will <laughs> some will just be like they're stoned 
Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I really should have asked this. Um, <laughs> and, um, and now it's become one of my favorite things. I, I, um, I thought I would have to do more work with mm. improv because I thought, you know, none of these people are improvisers. They're from, you know, we've had people from the Mayo Clinic and uh, with uh -huh. a stroke survivor and just a, a wide array of people. And then I wow. discovered about halfway through the shows that it's all it's almost um, like working with uh, the Who's Line guys, same dead eyes. But, um, <laughs> but they just re they will react off of anything I say. And I mean, my big fear was in the yes and part of improv, they'd be great at yes, not so much with the and, but they've I actually see. have added stuff and thrown some wonderful curves into a scene where I thought, okay, I know where this is going. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> and every night um, we would have a star. We would have someone who would be the best improviser. And mm. as I say, I went from that 80 year old stroke survivor to uh, uh -huh. it was a young woman who suffered from um, like crippling, um, social anxiety and afterwards i was talking to her and she said i have no idea why i volunteered but when i was on stage that is the best i've ever felt in my life and she was oh. going to um continue she was going to search out for um improv classes and, and I, I should have taken her name so i could have kept in contact but it's it's uh -huh. um it's fascinating um hmm. I, I had to take a I, I just did, a, uh, I was part of a documentary called um, Act Social about using improv as a tool to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And part of it was, I was in an MRI machine for an hour and a half doing improv, because there was this guy in um, San Francisco doing um, a study on what happens to the brain when you improvise. Oh, okay. And what happens is the part of your brain that's about self-criticism and self-awareness activity shrinks and the creative part of your brain um, expands and Assad was saying it's the very same thing in uh, hypnosis when you're hypnotized mm -hmm. all that that part of you says oh I can't do this or I'm going to be embarrassed that's it's gone or subdued somehow so huh. it, yeah it's been an interesting marriage <laughs> no, that's that's amazing and i i was watching some clips online too and it was just i, I maybe it was in edinburgh the uh there was like a haggis and pie throwing contest between oh, yeah, i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> yeah I, and there was another one where you were a sheik and and um the audience members were trying to belly oh, yeah. dance and convince oh, yes. you that yeah yeah, yeah it's a so, lot of i mean it's a lot of fun i'm like the first like 20 minutes of the show is Assad putting people under and I just find it mm -hmm. fascinating. I mean, I'm watching off stage and I'm at the point now where I can go, okay, they're under faking, faking, faking. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's some people who so much, they just want to be hypnotized and they'll just go, oh, well, I'll go along with this and then maybe it'll happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> luckily, Assad is uh, amazing at uh, sort of weeding out the people who aren't under. Wow, that's. A, I was gonna ask, has he hypnotized you just to see what it's like, or? No, he. Ha we keep talking about it, and then I think, you know, I said yes to this pretty easily, so maybe he did hypnotize me. I just <laughs> I can't remember. Um, yeah, he hasn't. I, I, I probably should get him to do it. That's really interesting. And it's also fascinating what you were talking about in the parts of the brain where you feel self conscious and, and that sense tends to go away or get highly diminished when you're doing improv and hypnosis too. And I was just thinking about, I heard you on other podcasts and, and other interviews where you were saying that you were kind of a shy boy and uh, until a friend kind of persuaded you to go into a play and then that's where you got addicted and craved Addic laughs. Yeah. And addicted is the perfect word. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did an interview. Brad and I were doing shows in India, and I did an interview mm -hmm. where I said it was like that first laugh. It was like um, it was like a shot of a heroin. Heroin. I immediately got addicted to it. Next day, there was a headline: Colin Mo Mockery into drug addiction. I thought, <laughs> okay, something, <laughs> something happened between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some sort of loss of translation. Yeah, something here. happened. Uh, <laughs> it didn't. But yeah, I mean, my wife calls the guy on whose line the other, 
because it is not it's so unlike me. That guy is a laugh whore. <laughs> Will do anything <laughs> to get a laugh. And um, off stage, you know, I can be, uh, you know, charming and funny. But you know, in mm. our relationship, she's the funny one. She's the storyteller, and it's perfect because I don't have to um, deal with people then. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> and and I was gonna say too. I I um I know that I know you talked about a lot of things that happen in the brain with improv and and hypnosis and i was also listening to you saying that you you and your wife were applying that to daily life and trying to yeah. do yes and and it ended up taking you guys to the congo yeah yeah wow. our very first test let's go somewhere <laughs> that was never on our destination board <laughs> uh, and it ended up being one of the most uh, incredible trips of our life we went there with world vision to do some commercials focusing mm -hmm. on um getting um foster um, mm -hmm. care for, for uh, children there. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd left right after Christmas. So we went from North American consumer insanity to the jungles of Africa where uh, just extreme poverty and mm -hmm. um, just meeting these people with this incredible spirit. I, 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 I still have visions of my wife deb leading all the kids in the hokey pokey uh, by oh. the stream there and then just having uh, so much fun and i thought wow I, I i i was so glad we said yes it became one of the um most memorable two-week periods i also oh. got disagree but hey <laughs> oh no well luckily i waited till the last um i i, I waited till the very last day so you know i had the 12 hour flight with <laughs> some oh, no. problems <laughs> that's not the souvenir you want to bring back home with it you. really isn't it really <laughs> oh no and, and i also you so you met your wife deb um at second city when you were performing mm -hmm. there and then from second city that's when you auditioned and didn't get the part for whose line i, th I heard it was three times uh, was the charm yeah, for you to a lot of misinformation out there uh... <laughs> I've heard some, oh, I've heard it was three times. I heard that Ryan accidentally killed me backing out of a driveway. <laughs> There's all these weird rumors. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard after you, after you got cured of your addiction, then you- Yes, uh... then it was, I was just staggering. <laughs> um, I had auditioned, they had come through, saw a show at Second City. They really enjoyed the show. They auditioned yeah. us the next morning at eight, which, uh, anyone in comedy, you know, bad time, <laughs> bad time to audition people who have a, a show at night. And uh, because we were, we'd worked together as a cast for a while, mm -hmm. we did the thing, you know, we supported each other, everybody, nobody mm -hmm. was show voting, so nobody stood out. So none of us got hired. Uh, then we moved down to LA because Deb had written a, a TV show that had been uh, picked up. I auditioned mm -hmm. again. It was like with people I didn't know. So it was, hey, screw you. Look at me. And um, I got it from that. And then my first show, I think this is where they get the third one from. My my first show sucked on Who's Line. So, and I thought <laughs> once it was over, I thought, well, you know, that's it. <laughs> this little British show, who, who cares? But... Um, the year after I'd sucked, they decided to do some shows in New York for some reason. I think mm. it was through, at that point, the Hot Network, which later became Comedy Central. Mm. So uh, Ryan was on the show at that point, and we had uh, grown up together. And he said, you know, give uh, Colin another chance. So they put mm. me with him, and then it was a slow, slow climb <laughs> to <laughs> the middle of iconic committee. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and but what a glorious climb it was because i um, i remember watching it with my brothers and sisters i mean still to this day sometimes i'll go down youtube rabbit holes and always end up on whose line um but it, it was such an incredible show to see and and i thought uh, you everyone was phenomenally talented but i i always was waiting for you and your lines because there would just be these things that you would say that just completely took me by surprise and i sometimes you can get a, a whiff of where something's gonna go but mm -hmm. then sometimes um you would just completely yeah it on its head. So. i always felt like i was almost like the audience representative because i was the person but people would look and go why is he on the show? He just looks like he's panicking <laughs> all the time. Like, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, Stephen Frost said uh, uh, from the British thing, he said, yeah, when I, I first worked with him, I thought, oh, he's really nervous because he just had that panicked look. And he said about four years in, he still had the same look. <laughs> so I realized <laughs> it's just his thing. I don't think it's panic. I think my mind is just racing that maybe the wrong expression comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I was going to ask you, because I, I had um, read through and asked me anything on Reddit that where you had answered questions from fans. And you had mentioned, somebody asked, how was the show created and set up? And you were saying that it, it lasts about three or four hours and you guys, um, you know, do about, what was it, 20 different segments or something like that. And they splice it up. And so they make about three or four different episodes from that, which is yeah. really interesting to me. I, I thought, wow, an, an audience member or I mean you guys performing for three or four hours straight that's a lot of of performance time yeah um yeah Hopefully it, it wasn't at eight in the morning like the audition <laughs> no it, it wasn't <laughs> um no it, but it never it always seemed to go very quickly I mean the last hour was horrendous because it was <laughs> um as we were doing the show the producer would be cutting it into different shows in his mind so okay um the next hour was actually where we had to work the most because the audience would sit there while you know drew or aisha whoever the host was was just mm -hmm. doing intros like and now uh, to start the second half we're doing greatest hits or now to start the second half it's scenes from a hat and then <laughs> so that was an hour of that because the producer is insane he's <laughs> um Dan Patterson, I mean, God bless him. He gave us all a career. We're very thankful. He's a control freak, which is an interesting person to have in charge of an improv show. He would come up after shows and go, you know, when we gave you that scenario, we thought you were going to do this. And I said, Dan, it's been 30 years. You know we're making this up, right? <laughs> I mean, you more than anyone should know we're making it up. So, um, yeah, so the, the last hour was a lot of work. But that was, I mean, as gigs go, especially the American uh, series, it was two weekends. We go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you goof around with your friends and uh, that was it. And then somehow, like we haven't shot since 2019. We got mm -hmm. renewed for this season. We got renewed for next season, even though <laughs> if I can get more gigs where I don't actually have to show up somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> so perfect but yeah they just have they would just have so many shows left over from um yeah because i guess we do so it'd be like 80 shows a week or 80 scenes a weekend they usually do mm -hmm. four uh four to five in a show so yeah they have a, a lot left over that's really cool and i was thinking back because I, I remember watching i think i watched all of the seasons uh and i don't remember ever going Wait, that looks like the same shirt that he had last oh. time. Did you did you get a lot oh, yeah. of that? Oh yeah, you'll get a lot of <laughs> four shirt because I was the only person on the show who didn't say no to the wardrobe people. <laughs> so I had fish. You'll see four episodes with me with a fish shirt or one with little mandolins, and they always took pleasure uh, playing with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Oh, that's that's really interesting. And I was going to ask too. I um for since it is all improv and it is for net tv networks and i think america might be a little bit more stringent on censorship than mm -hmm. perhaps maybe canada or the uk what was that like with censorship was it difficult to get things passed through and i mean how did they even censor things yeah Just it like was um it was insane because in britain anything goes there, uh, there were f bombs. There, were, and uh, because we had that freedom, we didn't really go there that much. I think there was like maybe two f bombs the entire um, mm -hmm. British season. And yeah, mm -hmm. some of the stuff would be a little risque. That mm -hmm. was it. But then when we came to the states, it was okay. That's over now. <laughs> we had there was because there was no script for the censors to look at. There'd be a censor in the booth. So our first show. Um, what had happened? Oh, um, my thing was, I was supposed to be in love with Greg Proops. So um, at one point, I kissed him. This voice comes over the PA going, um, can you make up something else, please? <laughs> what? And um, in this previous scene, 
I had um, killed three women, thrown them out a window. Fine. <laughs> Absolutely fine. So the thing was, Drew has a real button on censorship. It drives him crazy. So for the next 20 minutes, none of his intros were usable because he'd be using words to describe the scene that aren't allowed on television. Uh, so they decided after a, uh, a meeting that the censor would be there. Um, we taped the show. And then after the show, the producer and the censor would go over parts that uh, she felt was um, iffy rather than stop the flow of the show. And it, it kind of worked out. One of the best, one of my best showbiz memories is Dan Patterson coming up after one of the meetings going, uh, Colin, we lost a pussy, but we got two penises. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay. Uh, thank you. And what was weird though, we didn't really know where the line was because they, there were some things they let go that I thought, oh, in interesting. And then some things, there was one hoedown where they bleeped Ryan saying hand. And your mind immediately went to 50 things that were worse than the word hand. <laughs> so. <laughs> It seemed to have the wrong effect. A lot of times where they bleeped stuff, it, it made you think of something much more offensive than what was actually said. So um, we decided early on, you know, we can't worry about it. We're pretty mm -hmm. good. We, I mean, we know we have to get a show out, so it's not going to be wall-to-wall -wall swearing and uh, sexual. Mm -hmm. or, well, maybe it was, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we had to keep an eye on <laughs> getting a show out. So uh, mm -hmm. I thought we were pretty good considering. Oh, that's that's amazing. And and um, very interesting to hear about the differences between the British and the US version. I was going to ask too. speaking of differences. I know it's the same language, right? <laughs> but did you did, did you feel any pressure or nervousness thinking of, okay, is the humor a little bit different in the UK versus Canada and, and yeah. the US? I mean, I was fortunate in a way in that I was born in Scotland. So at home, I had a lot of British influences. But still, mm. the reason I sucked in my first show was for that very reason. Um, I got there um, uh, the hour before the show taped. Um, it was Tony Slattery, Mike McShane, and Sandy Toxvig, who were all lovely. But then mm -hmm. I just kind of uh, psyched myself out. I thought, yeah, we do have the same language, but will they get my references? And I just met these people, but I have a yeah. chemistry with them. And then because of that, I really uh, held myself back. And I think I had one funny thing. And yeah, and I think they were right to sort of get rid of me after that because I, I didn't, um, I was going to say I didn't put out, but it was, that wasn't quite what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't rise to the occasion. There we go. Uh, news lines across the, yeah. <laughs> yes. Colin didn't put out. put out. <laughs> um, uh, no, but that's, that's really interesting. And I was going to ask too, I mean, did um did it take a long time because it seems like from what i've heard and from what i've he heard you say it's like i go up there and there's almost less pressure because i go up there and i have nothing prepared so i can just feel free to just let things fly and, and go out i mean how long did it take you to get to that point and get to that level and is it it's still challenging sometimes where um you get distracted or you might start to think of other things that get in the way of pure improv? Uh, I, I think I learned fairly, fairly early on. And it's a, a part of my personality that doesn't exist anywhere except on stage of being totally fearless and uh -huh. having trust in other people, which I do not have in real life. But you know, when I'm working with the, the guys from Who's Line, when I'm touring with Assad or Brad, I know those guys and I know they've got my back. So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've all gone through horrible experiences together on stage um, and we know we've survived it. You get to a point too, where it's like, yeah, what's the worst that can happen? They don't laugh, they're idiots. <laughs> I'm, I'm incredibly <laughs> funny, it's not my fault. My stuff is too, <laughs> too intelligent for them. <laughs> I can walk across the stage like a chicken. Yeah. So, but it's, um, yeah, for, most of my work, especially now, just because I'm in what my 40th year of improvising, just making sure that I go out on stage with 
like absolutely nothing, which is totally relaxed and just focusing on uh, whoever I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's why I work with a lot of um, companies I don't know. Um, I start, uh, there's a group in uh, Atlanta called Dad's Garage. And uh, at that point, it was run by um, a Canadian. And we bumped into each other and he said, would you come? And I worked with these people I didn't work before. And it was great because it made me go back to sort of the mm -hmm. basics. I have to listen to these people because I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where they're going to go. I have to yes and. And now they become one of my favorite places to work with. But I constantly go out and work with people that I've never uh, met before just to sort of had that refresher course. That's really interesting that you mentioned that too. How long does it take to be able to get the other person's, I don't know, develop a chemistry with them or understand? Is it just pretty immediate if you let it, it happen and you're just... Yeah, I mean, it also depends on the person. There's some people who immediately, when uh, Ryan and I started working together, it was like immediate. It was like I'd been working with him all my life. Then there was, there was a guy at Second City uh, and we're really good friends. Mm -hmm. And we had the longest time trying to make improvising together work. And we're, we're both funny, uh, we're both mm -hmm. good improvisers, but for some reason, and then we realized it's because we were being too polite with each other. We were letting the other person sort of, we, we would sit back and go, okay, what do you want to do? I'll support you rather than this is what we're doing. And then once mm -hmm. we got into that, it became, um, it was great. So there are, there are some people you immediately, I, I think it all comes down to their commitment. When you see their commitment, you commit as much and you immediately become, you know, what it was probably like in the trenches in World War One. You're immediately, okay, this is, we're going through this together. <laughs> and and um, I, I was also going to ask about improv from a Zoom perspective, because I know that you and Brad are doing Zoom shows. What is that like? And and what are, what are the differences that you're feeling from a... A digital uh, audience. Well, I mean, you do a show to no laughter, which you know Brad is used to. For me, <laughs> it's a, it's um, I have to. Once the pandemic uh, started happening, we realized fairly quickly it's going to be a while before we get back to being in theaters. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, the people who book us had this incredible tech team. And so we got together and tried to figure out a way of doing our show. Uh, we realized fairly quickly, we couldn't actually do a, sort of a taped version of our stage show because once you're on a screen, everybody's attention span shrinks like immediately. So we came up with this sort of improvised sketch show where the scenes are shorter, still improvised. Hmm. Using a technology I do not understand. Uh, Brad is in Vegas. I'm in Toronto. It looks like we're in the same room. We can go into audience members' living rooms and talk to them, have them in our scenes. Mm -hmm. So it's been, um, it's actually, and we had a real creative burst while we we're trying to figure out what to do with this. And we yeah. found yeah. fairly early, we had to find a way to make the technology our friend rather than something that was limiting us. So we came up uh, and with the use of the green screen, we can do special effects that we didn't have available to us in our stage show. And it's become a, a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's still not the same as being in a theater with a live crowd, but it's pretty damn close. How and just thinking about hip hop and the, the Zoom shows, it just seems like you're able to adapt so well and be able to do these new innovative things and I feel like it takes a lot of courage, especially when you have no idea how it's going to go. What is that difficult for you? Or do you just jump into it and you're like, I'll worry about the consequences later? No, yeah, I've always embraced, embraced failure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's where you learn. Um, and so, you know, all of these projects had a kind of a, a rock not a rocky start but certainly n nothing close to what it's like now because it's you do learn a little we never had a show that just failed completely there'd always be little things and even in the zoom show there'd be technical things that we found out how to get around 
Um, and with the hip prov, there were times where all of a sudden people would come out of their uh, trance in the middle of a scene. You go, okay, well, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> so, but then you, from that, you find a way of dealing with that. And okay. Assad okay. found ways to keep them in the trance throughout the show. Um, so I find it a little learning experience. And my thing is, you never, you never know. I mean, when I try to think how they pitched Who's Line to a network executive, there's four guys you've never seen before. They don't have a script. People shout at them. They make up stuff. You got a show. <laughs> Can we have 22 episodes? Uh, there's nothing there that says, oh, yeah, that's going to be a successful show. Um, it takes... Um, you, you just have to take a chance and sometimes it may not work but sometimes it may lead to something that will work maybe there is an element of that that will make your next thing a success mm -hmm. wow so inspirational and you can't fail without trying you can't succeed without trying so and you you there are no certain certainties you know especially in the entertainment world you just do it and hope for the best yeah yeah no that's great Last question before we get into the advice, I was going to ask after this pandemic, hopefully within the next couple of months, optimistically thinking, ends, what do you hope to get back into or start new or what are, you, what are your dreams, aspirations? Yeah, right now I got a movie to finish in Utah. <laughs> Which, so I, I got to lose the weight I gained uh, during the pandemic oh, no. just to match up with, um, that. And then, um, I mean, we had so many um, gigs uh postponed so i'm i'm guessing i'll be doing the, the shows with brad with hip prov and there's always stuff that comes out of nowhere um mm -hmm. like a couple of years ago i was asked to do um king lear i mean not i mean the play i not i was not <laughs> well and colin doesn't put out so it didn't happen <laughs> i appreciate it. but um <laughs> and so it was me and all these Shakespearean actors who um, are like the best in Canada work at Stratford all the time. Wow. And it was terrifying, but again, one of the uh, best experiences of my life because I, it's certainly not anywhere near my comfort zone and, you know, working with actors, that's what's that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> little things like that come out of nowhere and it keeps me um, sort of invigorated and sort of, you know, fuels the creativity. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Oh, well, good. Um, we're going to get into the advice portion of the podcast. And before we do, uh, before we answer questions, I like to get us nice and inspired with an inspirational quote. Now, I know you actually just five seconds ago doled out like six or seven of them, but I wanted to ask, do you, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, do you have any um, inspirational quotes that you maybe on a daily or weekly basis you think about that help get you through your dark days? I don't know if this is inspirational. I don't even, my thing has always been, um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And that has really served me. I mean, when I got out of theater school, almost everyone I graduated with got jobs right away. And um, I learned fairly early on not to compare their successes uh, with mine. Everybody goes at their own pace. I mean, when I became you know, known from whose line, I was 44. So mm -hmm. marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to ask, what facial cream do you use? Because you look the exact same. Oh, God if, bless you. It... It's, uh, <laughs> it's all natural. I, I, <laughs> so I don't I do not do anything. I just have lucky Scottish skin, I guess. If it, <laughs> that sounds like a brand name, Lucky Scottish, Scottish Skin. skin. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for the hair, I think your hair is like your tree rings to see how yeah, old you are. It is. Okay. My hair uh, <laughs> was like this color, like a 22. During Who's Line, my hair was dyed. And when you look, you go, wow, some of it just looks like I have a black helmet on. And then sometimes it's kind of blonde, but they, their thing was, we can't have people that look funny on this comedy show. <laughs> okay. You know what? I, I don't think anyone's going to think I'm actually in my 20s. I'm, you know, I'm the oldest one here. I think the audience will cotton on to that fairly soon. I'm sure they were like, well, let's get him the fish shirts to distract from the, the dive. <laughs> yeah, that, 
That's exactly <laughs> what it was. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, that was a beautiful inspirational quote. Thank you, Colin. I've actually got an inspirational quote as well. It's oh, actually sure. not by any person, but it's by a robot called Inspirobot. So what it does is it uses AI to take some of the wisest words known to man, mash them together, and uh, inspirational quote. Um, so I'll read it. And if it means anything to you, feel free to, to uh, let me know what inspiration it draws. <clears throat> but <clears throat> this week, Inspirobot says, Strike a pose like a psycho when you sleep. Yeah. Well, during my dating life, that may have been something. <laughs> I don't know. If... I, don't... Uh, I don't think uh, Spyro is on top of his game today. <laughs> I, yeah, that didn't sound very inspirational. That sounds a little bit more. Most things you can make a metaphor into something. Strike a posing while you're asleep. I guess it's in your subconscious still have that psycho energy you have when you're conscious it will help you get to where you need to go that <laughs> extra push i like it's like manifestation in your sleep you you let your body do all the hard work by be striking that pose and then when you wake up yeah you're it's the word and... psycho that sort of throws it off a little <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah the psycho yeah. part kind of concerns me and uh inspire about i don't know if it's turning into skynet or not but this is an indication that we should watch out absolutely but, <laughs> all right we've got some questions too that some fans have sent in from all the barnacles of the internet so we'll go ahead and try and answer those this first one um rob found it on reddit thank you rob it says completely shaved need some help so i've had to shave my mustache and probably will have to clean shave for the next four years problem is i look like a 12 year old are there any forms of exercise that can make me not look like i have a baby face and so, Colin, I, you have the immortal baby face, so I don't know if you're yeah, the best person to... I would say, you know, drink hard for three weeks. You'll get... And sleep <laughs> on your face a lot more. If you really want to age like a it. psycho. <laughs> yeah. Maybe soak your head in a tea for a couple of hours a day just to get that weathered look. Um, you know what? Hang on to your youth for as much as you can. Uh, it goes quickly. So, you know, don't worry about it. It's other people's problems. You may think you look um, uh, 12. I'm going to say you don't. It's just <laughs> your image of yourself. So sleep psycho and be safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I don't think it could be put any, any better. Um, all right. Before the last question, I've got a segment called Positive Spin. And so I put this in because a lot of times when bad things happen to us, we start to think immediately of the negative. And so that doesn't allow us to think of solutions to be able to, uh, to um, the solutions to our problems. So I've created a scenario where um, you and I can start thinking of some positives. So Colin, this scenario okay. is uh, very close to my heart right now with COVID. Um, the scenario is you lose your sense of taste permanently. I know you're a good cook and mm -hmm. uh, I know you cook a mean turkey dinner, but say you lose your sense of taste forever. Are there any positives to that? Um, it, well, in some uh, aspects, I did a play called Art. And in the last scene, it's the three characters sitting around eating olives. I hate olives. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I, I despise it. So they had to prop the prop department had to come up with fake olives for me. So I could do that show now because I can't taste anything. <laughs> that and celery, any shows that are based with celery and olives, I'd have no problem with. <laughs> oh, that means you could look really cool drinking a martini too, because yeah. they usually have the olives. Japanese game shows where I have to eat like <laughs> bull testicles and things. Big money winner right here. <laughs> no problem just let it slide down the gullet and you're you're totally yeah. fine yeah oh. well that's that's wonderful and then the last question before we bid ourselves adieu is um joshua found it from reddit it says should i be worried if my spouse stopped getting me presents on christmas valentine's and my birthday does this mean the love is gone short answer yeah <laughs> <laughs> there is a no also, um, are you also, um, are you making an effort on those holidays? And in fact, are you making an effort on the non-holidays? You know, a lot of times when uh, things are going well, 
that's actually where you have to do a little more work because if you start taking things for granted things start to slip away really quickly and the other person starts to feel uh you know ignored taken for granted always make sure that person feels special then you'll get a present oh yeah make sure that you give so that you can also take that's that's what it's all about <laughs> Oh, well, great. We've reached the end of the podcast. So first off, just want to say a huge thank you, Colin, for, for jumping on and oh, making you. my day. I, and I hope you uh, heal quickly. Both oh. you and your wife. And I hope you've learned something about eating out. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's uh, <laughs> not good to do in a pandemic. I, I was going to ask, where can people find you? What have you got going on? And uh, where, what would you like to plug? Uh, Brad and I are... Uh, currently doing shows every weekend. If you go to passportshows.com, you can get tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really cheap, you can have like 50 people watch from the one <laughs> thing. <laughs> so you're saving a lot of money and uh, we get a bigger audience. And um, I think that's it right now. You know, doing a lot of uh, fundraisers and uh, events. I, I can't remember. I'm actually doing a play reading on March 16th, I have no information. It's called, uh, it's a famous play, She Stoops to Conquer, which actually was my first professional show in Vancouver. Oh. I'm no longer playing the ingenue though. <laughs> a Neil guy did, in it. Did you ask if there are olives involved? I did not, but I'll be at home. It's all virtual, so I can eat anything I want. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. Some, some grapes instead to substitute. Amazing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got going. Awesome. All right. Well, this was an absolute blast. Thank you so much, Colin. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Stay safe. All right. Thank you. You too. Bye, Bye Drake. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>